Welcome to the Open Textbook Network Winter Webinar Series, Building an Open Textbook Publishing Program. My name is Karen Lauritsen. I'm a Managing Director with the OTN. And this is the first of three webinars we're offering our community and the Library Publishing Coalition community as part of a webinar exchange. Our two organizations became strategic affiliates in the fall. And this is the kickoff of many upcoming collaborations. I'd like to thank Melanie Schlosser and Allie Laird for their collaboration. And if you have any questions about the three webinars we're offering this winter, please contact me. As I mentioned, the series is going to be recorded and shared. So on the slide you're looking at now, you can see that the OTN offers a variety of publishing resources, both for our members and for the higher education community at large. Many examples are listed here including the Publishing Cooperative, which you can hear more about at the LPC webinar on February 6th. Like this webinar, the OTN and LPC members are invited to attend. RSVP, please, if you haven't already, using the Google form I just put in the chat. I would also like to invite you to join us at the Library Publishing Forum pre-conference in Vancouver, which is on the next slide. This is happening on May 8th, when we will spend the day focused on publishing open educational resources. Now, without further ado, <clears throat> I would like to introduce our featured guest. I'm delighted that John Warren, who's the Director and Associate Professor of the Masters of Professional Studies in Publishing at George Washington University, is here to present guidance on the fundamental question, should you publish? John has more than 25 years of senior management experience in publishing, having led groundbreaking initiatives in digital content development and distribution. That includes ebooks, short form digital content, enhanced ebooks and websites, open access journals, and open educational resources or OER. Previously, John served as the director of the George Mason University Press and Mason Publishing Group. Prior to his work at George Mason, he served as the marketing and sales director for Georgetown University Press, marketing director for publications at the Rand Corporation, and marketing manager for Fondo de Cultura Economica. As I mentioned, we have saved time for, for questions at the end. And now I would like to turn it over to John. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, I'm Really pleased to be here and thank you both uh, Karen and Melanie for inviting me to present today and um, I look forward as well to the other uh, episodes in this series which will be following and Karen might say some words about that at the end about the next ones in the series. Uh, so today as Karen said we're going to look at questions of, of should you publish and can you publish. So we're going to kind of rock and roll here a little bit and move through this material pretty quickly. We're gonna cover a lot of ground, but as Karen said, this is going to be recorded and there are also a lot of resources that you can take advantage of. I have a short bibliography at the end, uh, in particular the, the library publishing curriculum, as well as the open textbook network publishing curriculum and some other materials that you can uh, peruse at your leisure, and we'll have time for questions. So you may come across a lot of different scenarios in your work. Um, these are a few from my own personal experience, a professor who wanted to develop a workbook or textbook for courses on public relations. You might run across a professor that wants to develop materials for her court appointed mediation course, or a textbook for English language learners or for other languages. There are a lot of different resources uh, that people want to develop. And one thing that you may also find yourself doing is being in a room with a lot of different administrators, faculty members, uh, center directors talking about open educational resources, which are a big topic at a lot of universities, both public and private. So the fundamental question is, should you publish these resources and how do you go about that? 
So before we go on, let's just kind of define our terms here. Publishing can obviously mean a lot of things. In this case, we're talking about developing open textbooks. Uh, this could be part of a wider open educational resource initiative, part of a library publishing effort. Uh, it could entail things like project consultation, project management, maybe editorial and design, production, hosting and distributing, and even marketing finished textbooks. So it could be a lot of things. One way we could frame this to start off with is both as a project based or a program. So project based uh, pretty simply is, is a kind of one off effort or maybe one at a time where you have really a predefined scope. Uh, the time and cost are, are limited. A program uh, such as a library publishing program can decide that this is gonna be part of their overall program and you don't really have an end date, you have larger ambitions maybe to impact the whole institution, maybe to collaborate with other institutions in your state or across the country or across the world. So again, project-based publishing is more limited. Um, this is the way a lot of people start off. The objectives and costs can be relatively easy to describe and measure. Again, it's relatively short term. There's few stakeholders. The risks are relatively low. However, since it's a one-off project, sometimes the expectations or the different responsibilities or the communication pathways may not always be the clearest. A lot of times, individual projects uh, lead to a program. Uh, so you may start out doing a couple of these projects and it leads to a whole open textbook publishing program, or again, it may be part of a library publishing program in general. So a publishing program obviously is longer term, may involve many years and multiple staff. Generally, you're gonna need some kind of funding and some kind of sustainability plan you have higher risk, but you also have the potential to make a bigger impact. Uh, this will typically involve a lot of different stakeholders and often will mean the, uh, collaboration across the department, across the organization, and even across institutions. So a good way to start, if you haven't done this already, and I know many of you have already done this, is to do an environmental scan uh, identifying what needs and opportunities there are. There are probably faculty at your institution interested in this or already doing this. Some people are self-publishing these open textbooks. Um, so identifying who is kind of innovative and willing to uh, maybe be the guinea pigs. Um, there may be departments or centers interested in doing this, uh, such as a Center for Teaching Excellence or an online learning center. And a good opportunity often exists with new majors or kind of different degrees that might need course materials. Oftentimes faculty uh, with these kind of uh, new or more innovative degrees find that there are not existing textbooks and so they want to develop their own materials. So how does this all work? How do you put this together? Here we're gonna talk a little bit more about a program based, but this applies to projects too. Uh, so de defining what expertise you have, what funding and staffing. So in terms of expertise, we're talking about different talents, you know, what really needs to be done, the editing, the design, the production, marketing or distribution, uh, what platforms you might use uh, with funding, Sometimes you have a mix of funding. You may be able to count on some operating funds. Uh, sometimes this will come from the materials budget from the library. Uh, you may be able to recover some of your costs by selling print on demand versions. I mentioned at the beginning that public relations textbook and uh, we were able to sell copies of that and, and really you know, do a little bit more than break even. Uh, staffing, of course, is very closely related to expertise, but here we're talking about, you know, bodies of the chair. Like, do you have the people 
on your staff or can you find research assistants? Can you, um, you know, maybe there's a course in editing that you could get them to, to do or a course on design. Uh, maybe you could use outside vendors. So you wanna try to identify any potential partners for both collaboration and funding. Uh, sometimes the provost office may have some funds that they can earmark towards open educational resources. This is something that a lot of provosts are hearing about in their meetings. Um, and especially if it's a state uh, funded college, uh, it's a big deal to have uh, uh, affordability efforts. A lot of times, as I said, the Center for Teaching and Faculty Excellence or the Online Learning Center. And there's a lot of different deans and department chairs and center directors that have an interest in this already. So you want to try to find where people's interests and objectives intersect. And a lot of times, as I mentioned, this is around open educational resources, uh, both adoption and development. So adoption, as you probably already know, means you know, finding materials that are out there, finding open textbooks that already exist. What we're talking about here is developing new and original materials. So one way to do this is to develop a call for proposals, uh, working with these partners, and your call for proposals would indicate that the project should have a summary, what they hope to achieve, uh, addressing uh, certain criteria, which we'll get to in a sec, uh, a timeline for developing this, uh, overall quality, and you know, can they really develop this? You know, do they have the, the means to, to write a textbook or to create a textbook? One thing I will say here in terms of timelines is often, the professor or faculty member or group will have a, uh, let's say, abbreviated timeline. Uh, it's, it's hard to know how long these things really take. So you may have to adjust people's expectations in terms of timelines. So some criteria that can be developed. These are criteria that we used at George Mason University when we were doing a call for proposals for open textbooks and for OERs. And this involved things that were high enrollment courses, courses that were required for all majors, uh, courses that had multiple sections, and courses that had high textbook costs. Uh, we stipulated that it did not have to meet all four criteria, but that it should meet at least one criteria. Uh, and we did a, a few rounds of proposals. The first year, we had 13 proposals, and we were able to fund all of them. And uh, the second time we had 11 proposals and again, we were able to fund all of them. Uh, so one thing I would say is that finding really innovative and committed faculty members is a key to this. Uh, having uh, some kind of grants does help. I would not say it's absolutely necessary. Many institutions will do it without funding uh, for the faculty members, but keeping in mind that this is a lot of work uh, not only for you to publish it, but for them to write it. So having some incentives does definitely help. So the next question is, where is this all going? So this is where you really want to develop an overall strategy, uh, a strategic plan. And a great way to do this is to tie your goals specifically to the university's strategic plan. So when you look at your university strategic plan, which is usually made public, uh, sometimes not, um, you want to look at where you coincide, like making education more affordable or perhaps innovation or student success, or there might be things about cross-departmental collaboration. So tying these goals specifically, uh, it really helps you with your communication efforts, but it also helps you with your direction. And if you're part of a library publishing program or part of the library, you also want to look at tying your initiatives to the library strategic plan as well. Things like student learning or reducing textbook costs or improving materials. So here's just an example of some strategic priorities for an open textbook publishing program. 
Uh, years may vary, uh, but these are some examples, again, contributing to the mission and strengths of the university, collaborating, digital dissemination, and what I encourage you to do is, is specifically tie these to the university's plan and the library's plan. Again, we'll have questions at the end, so feel free to ask questions about any of this. So another important step is to really articulate what your mission and vision is. Um, a lot of you have already done this, I'm sure. A mission statement states why your publishing program exists and kind of where you are. A vision statement is more aspirational. Uh, where you wanna be in the future, it's something to motivate you. And both of these should ideally be only one sentence. Um, the vision statement, you, you want it to be grounded in reality, but you know, really aspiring. So I'm gonna provide you here with an example. The Library Publishing Coalition, of which many of you are members, uh, recently the board went through an exercise to uh, redefine the mission and vision, and we came up with what I think are some pretty good, concise mission and vision. So. Um, this is a, just one example and one thing you if you're going to go through this exercise look at a lot of different missions and visions not only of publishing but other companies um, another part of this that I'm not going to get into here is developing value statements and that's also something that can be helpful so the next thing is to set strategic goals we already talked about some strategic priorities but now we're going to get a little bit more concrete with this a good method here is to develop a stretch goal, something that is kind of, again, aspirational, something you hope to achieve. Uh, it should really stretch your capabilities. That's why it's called a stretch goal, but ultimately it's achievable. You know, so it's not like uh, make world peace, but something that you really can achieve, but it's stretching your um, capabilities. And you combine that with the smart framework, which are goals or objectives that are specific, measurable, actionable, or achievable, relevant, and time-bound. So for publishing open textbooks, here's some examples. Uh, this is just one example. You can come up with others. Uh, one thing that's a good thing to do for your program is to develop maybe three or four of these stretch goals with corresponding SMART goals. You don't want to get more than 10 or it's just going to be confusing and people won't really know what direction you're heading. But here we have one is publish one to two open textbook projects by the end of the next fiscal year. And you have specific goals like scheduling meetings, uh, determining faculty needs, holding trainings, uh, developing a template for an open textbook, uh, and again, time bound. So identify within six months at least one open textbook to publish in the next fiscal year. So again, these are things that you can measure and we're gonna get to that in a minute. Another exercise to do is to identify your stakeholders. And I don't mean this just in a general sense, but in a really specific sense. Who are the different stakeholders? What kind of influence do they have? What kind of um, interest do they have in open textbooks? So you look at the university, you know, faculty and students and research centers. Perhaps there's a university press that you can collaborate with this, both in terms of expertise and direction, maybe with some marketing. Um, people at the library you're communicating with and collaborating with, and groups in the community, as well as service providers uh, like POD vendors and web developers. So there's a lot of different stakeholders. This is not limited to just these. The next step here, uh, as you're really getting involved, is to create a robust business plan. Um, here, Kate McCready and Emma Moles from the University of Minnesota Libraries Publishing recently published an article, which is in the bibliography here at the end, on developing a business plan for library publishing. And they identify some key steps, uh, defining your principles of service, defining the scope of service, uh, what staffing and governance you're going to have, 
what financials and funding sources and development and production. I would also add here distribution and marketing and perhaps technology and then measures of success. So I encourage you to read that article, which is very helpful for developing this. Another exercise to do is to conduct a SWOT analysis where you're looking at strengths that are internal to you. Uh, what kind of strengths do you have? Maybe you have great designers or production people, um, uh, opportunities that exist outside your organization. You know, in this case, uh, things like the, the effort and attention for open educational resources, um, weaknesses may be that you don't have a particular skill that you need to do this, or maybe you don't have the funding that you need. Uh, threats are external circumstances. Uh, an example here might be at some universities, the bookstore has a contract with the university that might prevent you from developing open textbooks, or maybe it has to be done through them. Uh, but again, this can be also be an opportunity. Uh, sometimes the university bookstore will be your partner in uh, doing print-on-demand versions. So where is this all going, and how do you measure whether you're being successful? So you want to try to measure and assess your progress towards your goals. This is... Um, uh, pretty obvious, but something that sometimes people don't think of in advance. So determining in advance what's important is really um, essential here. And we talked about developing strategic priorities and, again, making those measurable so that you'll know whether you're making progress towards them. And then doing some types of assessment um, regarding your progress, and that will help you improve your decision making down the road. This, of course, could be the subject of an entire webinar series of its own. Um, so I encourage you to look at other materials for um, assessment. But here's a few examples in terms of tying assessment to impact in terms of open textbooks. So did the publication actually reach its intended audience? Uh, did it reduce textbook costs? If so, by how much? Uh, one figure that uh, a lot of people use to estimate this, um, because it can be difficult, is $100 per student uh, as, a as a replacement cost. Um, you may be able to measure if it contributed to student engagement. For example, if the faculty member uh, surveys the class on how they reacted to the textbook, uh, whether, uh, whether they felt that it improved their learning. Uh, again, sometimes you're able to make some money by selling print-on-demand versions. Um, it may lead readers to seek out other publications that you've published. You may be able to collect reviews um, by students or outside reviewers. Uh, for example, the Open Textbook Network has reviews on textbook. And um, did it lead to new opportunities for collaboration? So again, if you've done a couple of these projects, people hear about them and they want you to do new ones. So this is all part of an impact loop that's a kind of continuous cycle. Again, you may have multiple projects in different uh, bubbles here, but again, you're setting your goals and setting your objectives and your SMART goals. You're implementing these strategies to, to publish open textbooks, assessing how they did, planning for improvement, and, and it's a continuous process. So as you remember at the beginning, we talked about different initiatives. So maybe one of your initiative is to make education more affordable for students and contribute to student success. And so you've developed a textbook for introductory listening and speaking for English language learners. And you can congratulate yourself and move on to the next one. So now we have time for questions and comments. And here's my contact information. 
feel free to reach out to me um, at a later date. And I do want to also um, share with you a bibliography here. And again, this is recorded, so we will have um, time to look at this later. Um, so let's go to questions. Thank you, John. Uh, there's already a question in the chat. I would like to invite everyone to continue to post questions in the chat, or if you prefer, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask your question uh, via voice. So John, Kathy is asking if you have a CC license on your slides. Ah, I did not put a CC license on my slides, but um, Karen, you are welcome to um, send the slides uh, to anybody. And again, I, I do understand that this is going to be recorded. So um, there's not a specific uh, CC license on there, but I guess I could add that. Um, but feel free to share them. OK. While people are reflecting on their questions, I would like to mention the second and third webinar in the series. Coming up on February 20th, Kevin Hawkins, who's Assistant Dean for Scholarly Communication at University of North Texas Denton, is going to explore the question, how should you publish? And then on March 14th, Inba Kehoe, who's Copyright Officer and Scholarly Communication Librarian at University of Victoria Libraries, will explore implementing a publishing program. So at the start of John's talk, he mentioned uh, launching open textbook publishing programs sometimes by supporting a particular project that may evolve into a robust program. And so Inba is going to talk about um, the evolution of the program and, and moving from a project or pilot phase into a um, program phase. Okay, I don't see any questions yet. Oh, thank you, Lauren. If you have an established library publishing program for journals or books, what considerations or advice would you have for extending that program to OER? So uh, that's a great question. And that's, uh, I think, typically how this evolves. Uh, so again, I would go back to looking at some of the strategic priorities of the university as a whole and finding how that coincides. I think that the partnership part that we talked about at the beginning is really important with this. It's something, um, this is something that has a lot of interest uh, in many institutions. It's, I think, difficult to do just by your own um, in terms of both funding and finding people that are interested. So um, that's why I think partnerships are really important. Um, one thing we did at George Mason University, besides the call for proposals that I mentioned, uh, one thing that I did not mention, we had done um, a few one-off trainings uh, on open educational resources, you know, what they are, how you identify them, how you develop them. And we worked with the Center for Teaching and Faculty Excellence uh, to actually develop a faculty learning community that was a monthly uh, monthly meeting um, and we had a different topic each month so one month would be you know identifying OERs another month would be you know publishing platforms and and we uh, had again it was an ongoing thing instead of just like a one-off training The next question is whether you know of good examples of environmental scans. And I'll just go ahead and extend um, this question to anyone who's attending the webinar. There could be other people who are here who may have examples in their pocket as well. Yeah, that would be great to hear from other people. I'll, I'll just say that this can be, um, this is kind of an ongoing process. Um, and I, I think just going out and talking to people and, and having meetings. Um, uh, I, I, I know like when I got to George Mason, I was starting a, both a small university press and a library publishing program from scratch and went out and just talked to as many people as I could to figure out what was going on. Um, so 
um, I know uh, also Elizabeth Scarpelli at University of Cincinnati did the same thing when when she started there is just go around and have meetings and you know get referrals it's kind of like it's a little bit like job searching when you do uh, informational meetings just go around and have have lots of coffee at Starbucks or wherever and um, find out what's going on and who you could work with so if anybody else has any suggestions about this, it'd be great to hear. Yes, we can definitely have a conversation. Um, in the meantime, Kathy has a request. Can you talk a bit more about recouping costs, print on demand programs and partnering with bookstores? So that's a three in one. Yeah, um, so in some programs you may be prevented from cost recovery in other programs that might be really important to do. Um, I would just say that in general, um, when you're talking about open textbooks, you know, it's easy to make them open online, uh, such as a PDF or an EPUB, uh, maybe with the open textbook publishing network. Um, but a lot of students do still want print. And so one of the things is to make them affordable and print on demand can help you do that. So uh, I'll, I'll mention again the example, we developed a textbook for public relations and this was a required uh, textbook and we were able to price it at $29.95 and, um, and they, um, we sold about 100 to 150 copies every semester because it was a required text. And so we were able to give the faculty members a small royalty and we were able to recoup some costs. Um, so it wasn't a huge money maker, but you know, we made some money and it made the Dean of the libraries happy that uh, uh, some revenue was coming in. All right, I have a follow-up question on that. Can you hear me? I unmuted. Yeah. Okay, um, how did how did the library get the money? I mean, could you show, could you maybe share with us the MOU or whatever you use to recoup the money from the bookstores? Do you have a, do you have an arrangement where the bookstore can print them, but they, uh, they aren't allowed to charge more than it costs them to print the book. So that's what we're trying to figure out. Well, how are you getting that extra buffer on top of that? Yeah, the bookstore didn't actually print it. I don't know of too many bookstores that would do that, but some some may have that capability. We actually just found a local printer that would do it. Um, there's also a lot of people use a company like Ingram, uh, Ingram Spark. Um, so it kind of depends. I would say uh, finding a local printer is good if you're only going to sell it at the university bookstore. If you're going to try to sell print on demand copies through Amazon or on a wider scale, you'll want to use a company like Ingram. Um, but what we did was we got bids from different printers, um, found a printer that was, you know, cheap, but good quality. And we were able to price it, um, that it was both affordable to students, but we were also recouping our costs and with a bit of a surplus. Uh, again, you know, printing, that, that's a whole subject you could look into, but, uh, you know, you, basically you want to make sure that you're recouping your costs at least. So thank I hope you. that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll add to that that the open license does allow for recouping costs, and there are um, bookstores that are willing and, and excited to partner on publishing open textbooks. Um, there are also people in the Open Textbook Network, if you have access, who have been researching print on demand. Amy Hoffer at Open Oregon is one, Karen Bjork at Portland State is another. Um, and I included a link in the chat to a little bit more information on printing on demand. It's a great question. So we have a great question from uh, Laura in London. Um, thanks for joining us all the way from London. Um, so the question here is, are you mainly developing textbook programs for local students or aiming to produce textbooks for a wider global reach? Um, and I think this is a really great question. Um, I, I would have to say from my own experience that generally what you're aiming at first is the local, uh, but trying to make it global if possible. And um, 
and and this is one reason why it's important to try to get into um, things like the Open Textbook Network and other um, platforms where you can share these with the CC license um, and, and really try to do a global reach. So in terms of researching, uh, you know, one of the things to do is are there already good textbooks out there? Um, you know, not I'm not talking about commercial textbooks, but are there good open textbooks already out there? Um, or does the professor or faculty members, you know, maybe it's a group, do they have something special uh, and unique? So um, just from my personal experience, I'll, I'll mention again, this one, one textbook was for a court certified mediation, and it was specifically for Virginia, and we developed this, but I uh, talked to the faculty member about trying to um, uh, do a version that would be uh, wider that could be for any you know uh, mediation course um, and that was something that you know we were still working on when i when I left Mason but uh, this is something that uh, again if you're doing a, a program um, you know you really do want to impact your local university but if you can impact on a global scale that's even better I think and I'll add there's an opportunity to do that by focusing locally, and then if it's an original textbook or a significant modification of an existing textbook, it can go in the open textbook library if it meets that criteria. And then potentially you are getting help with marketing and a global reach. Myra has a question. Thank you. So um, I'll let others actually contribute to this one as well. Um, I would say that in in my case, we did not have to turn down any faculty. Um, I think that's a, that's a position that definitely happens at some institutions, but when you're starting, um, it's, it's often, you know, the challenge is to get people to really commit to this because as I said, it is a lot of work. Um, so I, I guess I was lucky that I didn't have to turn anybody down, um, but that's partly why you develop these criteria um, to to be able to prioritize. So if anybody else has a comment about this, please uh, go ahead and, yeah. and, well, and... Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, oh, hello, it's, it's Laura from, um, from UCL. Hello, Laura. Hello, um, thanks for a great presentation. I, I just thought I'd chip in with turning down faculty. Um, at, at UCL Press, we have, we have a an existing publishing program for scholarly monographs and textbooks is in a is in a, an early stage of development. Um, but we we put out a call for proposals for textbooks and and we did have to turn um, quite a few of them down. Um, and we handled that by the by the by the ways that you actually described, John, uh, which were which were very good. Um, uh, according to um, criteria that we had preset and also through the review process um, and through an editorial board. So we had quite a lot of support uh, for evaluating projects and then giving very good reasons why we turned them down and actually inviting authors also to um, develop their proposals and, and to guide them, um, to give them a chance to, to, to pitch them correctly. Um, because I think authors do need a lot of that kind of support. Thank you, Laura. Um, and I did not talk about peer review here, um, but that is definitely something that is a good idea, particularly if you want to um, uh, make textbooks more widely available on a global level, yeah. and particularly if you want to uh, distribute them commercially, which some university presses do. I would say probably less library publishing programs, but some some do that as well. Um, on on the local scale, you know, if a if a professor uh, has a a textbook uh, that they've developed, you might not need to do peer review for that. But certainly, peer yeah. review is great. And. I'll add something here as well. I think part of what we're talking about is what makes a textbook unique and differentiating between a monograph or another proposal and a very specific textbook outcome that includes different um, pedagogical elements and structure. 
And so building that into the proposal or working closely with the author can also ensure that um, you have a shared understanding about what the end product is going to be. Yeah. So um, we have a few more questions. Uh, can you please comment on evolving OER formats beyond the textbook, as in nonlinear simulations, video-based works? Are you supporting these? And if so, who are your partners? So I can try to answer that. And if anybody else has um, any answers on that, that would be great as well. Um, I will say, at, um, in my experience at Georgetown University Press, where uh, we developed commercial textbooks, this was a, a, a big thing, is to develop websites that went along the, uh, with them and other, other materials, even apps. Um, but in terms of OERs, I did not have any personal experience of developing things beyond the textbook. Um, although a lot of OER adoption um, and identification does mean this, you know, find, finding these things, you know, finding videos, uh, finding other, other materials. But I personally don't have any experience uh, developing these. So if anybody else does that wants to chime in, please do. I second that um, if anyone would like to chime in. In the Open Textbook Network, we um, focus on textbooks as a strategy because there's still such a familiar and well-recognized um, pedagogical device. And so when you say textbook, um, we just know what we're working with. But I do know of many grant programs and support being offered um, for these other uh, outcomes. So Emily Frank, also has a question. And again, just because we're moving to the next question, if you have something you would like to add or um, chime in, please do in the chat or unmute yourself. Uh, we're very happy to have a conversation. And there's a lot of people on this call who have great experience and can offer um, resources. So Emily is asking, do you have any advice on approaching and collaborating with university presses on open publishing? We've approached some UP partners in the past and felt like they couldn't take on new work and didn't provide an added avenue for profit. Wonder if there are other elements of open publishing that university presses might generally find appealing. We could discuss with them the cost recovery print on demand potential. Um, so, so yeah, in, in my particular case at George Mason University, I, I was actually doing both, so it was easy. Um, to collaborate with myself <laughs> in that sense. Um, but at other places, of course, uh, you've got an established university press and a, perhaps a new library publishing program. And so that may be trickier. Uh, I would go back to that one slide uh, of having where your incentives and interests overlap. Um, and if you can find an overlap, that's where the potential is. So, uh, you know, just for example, if if you could uh, get the university press interested in doing a print on demand version that they could sell na nationally, um, that might be an incentive. You know where they're going to. Generally, university presses have a, a bigger incentive, I guess, for cost recovery than some library publishing programs. Um, uh, and there may be grants involved that you can go after together. Um, so I know there's, um, I think Mary Rose was on this call. Maybe she would like to chime in here um, or somebody else that has experience with that. <clears throat> but I think there is, I think there are um, good partnerships um, in this, but it, it can be difficult again because of the costs. Hi, this is Mary Rose. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, we're also a university press. I'm at Temple. And we report to the library and we are jointly trying to build a library publishing program that includes open textbooks. Right now, the funding for uh, and any kind of financial support for the open textbooks is coming from the library, although we're trying to build a model uh, budget and Annie Johnson, uh, who's working with me on this, is actually going to be working with Kate McCready uh, on a business plan to try to figure out um, to make sure that we're taking into account all the costs that we're going to occur incur and then will we charge the author back for some of them uh, that's our initial thinking it's difficult from the press side though um, 
we've committed to selling print on demand copies only to recover the um, the manufacturing and administrative costs. So the press definitely isn't looking at this as any way of um, recovering any costs. We are thinking that the author, you know, having the author cover some of the costs him or herself is the way we're gonna go. Although that might change depending on what Annie learns from Kate. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Mary Rose. And uh, if, if you guys wanna talk to me about that at some point in the future, I'd be happy to, to talk to you. Oh, we definitely do. Um, so, so yeah, it, it, it can get really complicated. Uh, again, I would say, you know, if you can get some money from the provost, and this is, um, this is Laura from UCL Press's next question, how do you incentivize authors? So Mary Rose mentioned, you know, charging the author, and, and in this case, you know, I, I would say, they're getting royalties, maybe. Um, sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. But um, if you have some grants, uh, so in the call for proposals that we did at George Mason uh, for a few years, we were able to offer grants between $1,000 to $5,000 uh, for OER adoption and development. And in the first year, I, I wasn't able to do this, but in subsequent years, I was able to right into the grant that there would be higher uh, incentives for development as opposed to just adoption. So one thing is, you know, finding OERs that are already out there as opposed to develop, developing original uh, textbooks or OERs. And so having a, a bigger incentive for people that are actually developing them is something. Um, and in terms of royalties, you know, some some authors make a lot of money on royalties for textbooks, but the average is not that high. Um, so if the author gets a grant ahead of time, you know, if the author can get $5,000 at the beginning to do this, um, that's more than a lot of times they're getting from royalties. Um, and again, if you can do a print on demand version, then you might be able to offer them a, a small royalty for, for that as well. Uh, it's Mary Rose again, if I can jump in to say, we mm -hmm. are uh, at the start, we're offering authors a $5,000 grant, but it is for developing a textbook. Um, and the idea is that uh, it will be enough of an incentive for them to devote the time necessary to you know, developing a high quality book, which we are having peer reviewed uh, as well. Um, but the idea of charging back for costs would be for production costs, editorial. Um, and we're hoping that we can get authors to do work in press books and be excited about, you know, doing some of their own um, production work in that way. But, you know, we'll see how that works out. Really, I think, um, I think our program, uh, perhaps naively, is uh, looking to work with Temple faculty who truly believe that uh, the cost of textbooks uh, is too high, it's an undue burden on their students, and it actually is resulting in students not buying the book, uh, and who are really committed to that and to the idea of open access. And we think that for those authors, the $5,000 grant is actually going to make a lot of, uh, a lot of difference uh, in them being able to spend the time that they need to develop a book. Yeah, I think, um, I think $5,000 is, is a good figure to try to shoot for. And, and that does, you know, give some incentive. And, and as I said before, uh, the, Average royalty for an author for developing a textbook is is not much more than that. So I don't Could think I just ask, that's really useful. Thank you to hear those those kind of figures being mentioned. I wondered with the with the five thousand um, dollars, where is that usually coming from? What what budget and um, and how many authors could you fund at that level typically? I think that varies. Uh, in my case, in George Mason, the funds came from the state of Virginia, but through the provost office, and we we had a five fifty thousand dollar a year.
budget for this. Um, right. And so we were able to fund multiple projects that way. Okay, oh, that's really helpful, thank you. And at Temple, it's coming from the library budget, uh, from the administration, library administration budget, the library admin budget, not the collections budget, uh, at least for now. We have uh, $20,000 this fiscal. A uh, portion of that is going actually to, and it's a general kind of scholarly publishing, um, scholarly communications library publishing budget. And a portion of that, uh, this fiscal is going to, as a stipend to a faculty advisor for uh, our undergraduate research journal. We should be able to fund three uh, this fiscal uh, mm -hmm. at this point. And this is Kate McCready from the University of Minnesota Libraries. Hi, we, Kate. Hi. Um, thanks, John, for the shout out about the article. Um, um, we have um, we have funding to award small grants, normally fifteen hundred or so, to rethink your curriculum, um, and some of those turn into publishing projects. Um, some of them are just looking at using more openly available sources. Um, that are already available, but some people want to create their own, and we the grant goes toward that. But then the libraries, um, and that money comes from the provost to the library, uh, which then we distribute that those funds. Um, and then separately, we use collection dollars to do production costs. So we don't, um, for University of Minnesota um, folks, uh, we don't seek any production costs uh, back from the authors uh, or the departments, partly because our funding model at the University of Minnesota is a, is a cost pool model. So each college department are in effect taxed in order to fund our budget. So we try to you know, give them back services and, and uh, resources for the money that they've already paid. Um, but we do fund some of our, um, that work through working with nonprofit organizations. That's an area of our business plan that we developed so that we can work with societies or, or nonprofits to um, recoup some costs that then we can use for funding University of Minnesota projects like uh, open textbooks. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll, just, I'll just mention that uh, likewise at George Mason, the, the grants were for the faculty for developing textbooks or for identifying OERs, but we uh, did not charge for the production um, and design. We, uh, we were part of the library budget um, and we did not have to charge back for that. Thank you to everyone who's contributing their stories. I know it's really helpful to hear um, more about funding and, and where the money is coming from. Sunny has a question in the chat with institutions using $5,000 grants. Do institutions keep copyright or do the authors retain copyright or do they share it? Uh, that's a great question, and I think that would de depend on the institution. In our case, the authors uh, kept copyright um, for ones that we were publishing and selling. We had joint copyright, um, and for ones that we were just developing, um, say, as a PDF, it was the author's copyright. Uh, in our case at Temple, the authors keep copyright. Uh, and actually for a uh, traditional university press, uh, Temple University Press book, we will, if the author uh, wants, uh, allow the author to hold the copyright. The university doesn't have a problem with that. I've, I've just replied, um, this is Lara again, I've just replied on the, on the chat that um, regardless of, of whether we pay an author or not. Um, we don't pay royalties. We have experimentally tried a, a small fee to encourage textbook proposals, but either way, um, authors always retain copyright with, with us. So in the, uh, in the library publishing curriculum, which I mentioned, there, there's uh, a lot of uh, talk about copyright in, in there. So you, you may look at that as well. Uh, Kevin Hawkins here. I did want to jump in and say that when paying authors up front, you may run into complications with your university's IP policy, where um, paying them to do work that's outside of their normal job 
uh, might be considered an additional task, an additional kind of work for hire on top of their regular position, uh, and then would require the university to own the copyright according to that policy. So it may be worth investigating at your institution what your usual policies are for um, ownership of IP um, and how that relates to you know, grant funded projects, but also you know, essentially what this is, which is essentially an intramural grant. And to add to what Kevin is saying, Meredith Jacob at Creative Commons came up with a sort of baseline OER publishing agreement that um, you could take to your general counsel and have that conversation and make sure that it aligns with your institution's intellectual property policy. So I put that link there in the chat. I am mindful of the time. Uh, this is a wonderful conversation, uh, but we have four minutes remaining. So if there are any last questions you would really like to ask, now is the time. Uh, you can do so in chat or um, again, unmuting yourself. I, in the meantime, am going to ask a question of my own. John, you talked early on about evaluating proposals and being sure that whoever you choose to fund can deliver. Can you talk a little bit more about um, evaluating proposals in response to a, a call? <clears throat> yeah, so this is uh, something that we did uh, do peer review on the proposals and had a group that evaluated them. Um, and another thing that we did was the grants were dispersed uh, over time. So there was a, a, an initial part of it and then a, a you know, second part uh, just to make sure uh, that people delivered. Um, so it was a kind of, and I think that's typical for grants that there's a you know, bid at first and a bid on delivery. Um, so, you know, developing those criteria that I, I just gave the, you know, really basics, but having a little bit more uh, explanation is helpful. And then uh, you can score them on a rubric and, you know, try to develop them that way. And, and again, this was a, you know, we had uh, four or five people in the room kind of debating them. Uh, we were able, as I said, to fund all of them because we had enough money, uh, but if it came down to, uh, like Laura from the UK said, uh, having to turn people down, then using that kind of rubric is really helpful and probably essential, I would say. Great, thank you. Well, I would like to invite everyone to thank our guest speaker for joining us today, John Warren, Director and Associate Professor, Masters of Professional Studies in Publishing at George Washington University. Thank you, John, for sharing this presentation. Thank you, everybody, and thank you uh, for both the attendees, for your questions and attendance, and, and thank you, Karen and Melanie, for inviting me. Absolutely. I would also like to thank everyone for chiming in and for the great questions and hope to see you in one of the upcoming webinars in our series. Until then, best wishes. Thank you. That was great. Really useful. Thanks. Good to hear. Thank you.